Welcome, Hillel. Thanks so much for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me. Would you mind telling our listeners a bit about your background and what you're currently working on? I am trained as a mathematician physicist. And then the last year before I entered grad school, I was like, this sucks. And then switched to being a programmer. I worked as a web dev for about three or four years before falling in love with formal methods. And now I teach and communicate about it full time as a writer and workshop instructor. How did you make that transition from being a web dev to what you're currently working on? I worked as a backend dev at an education company where we made software for schools. And due to quirks in sort of the problem domain, I ended up maintaining what I call an accidentally distributed system. We weren't expecting it to be distributed at the start. None of us had any experience, but it kind of started hitting all those issues with all the race conditions and partial failure modes and communication and Byzantine general problems. So I started investigating more and more tools to help deal with this system as it got more and more unwieldy and complicated and dangerous. And we couldn't just abandon it because it was making us all of our money. And at one point, I sort of stumbled this thing called TLA+. Amazon put out a paper on it. I read that paper, and it looked like it might be something interesting to apply. I applied it. It caught some major bugs almost immediately. And I was like, wow, this is big. So then I ended up wondering why people didn't use it very much and wrote an introductory tutorial and then a book and then workshops and then lectures, then classes, and it just spiraled out of control from there. What are some of the crazy Byzantine failures that you saw? There was a system where it would take a while to process responses, but it would be sort of a random delay before processing response, which wouldn't be a huge problem, except it turns out if you sent too many responses at a time, it would just cause it to start deleting data at random. We would just watch as entire like categories of data would just disappear, which would of course mean that we'd have to start resetting it, which means we'd have to send more commands and set all that back up, which then would cause it to delay processing even more. At some point, a memory leak happened. Uh, honestly, trying to fix that specific issue was the impetus to start using formal methods. What are some of the issues you caught once you started using TLA+. One of the factors we made was to sort of avoid that situation from happening by like being very careful about the commands we sent. And then we found out using TLA+, plus a couple of issues. One was that the way we designed it, there was very specific cases where we would actually get back into that loop of it's just randomly deleting data and us basically being back at square one, which we were able to sort of cut off without having to deal with because we discovered it within a couple of minutes of us writing the spec versus after the system was running in production for a while. And then another one that was really interesting that we caught in the same system, actually. Does your audience know what liveness versus safety is? I'd appreciate a quick overview. Okay. Very, very quick overview. Safety is that bad things don't happen. Liveness is that good things always eventually happen. And we caught what was called the liveness issue, this very specific series of cases where like, if things happen in just the right order, we could think that we were going to send data and like have it sync. And then it just never would. We would never actually get around to syncing that data. Those all sound like issues that would be difficult to catch or reproduce once you see them in production. There is one that I actually can't go into too much detail about. Essentially, we built a system that had obvious properties. And then after like two days of failing to like successfully model it, we ended up collectively agreeing that it would have been impossible to satisfy all three of our requirements. We could have two, but we'd have to weaken one of the three, which was this thing that was really cool to realize in just like a few days, as opposed to again, after we built the system, we're trying to frantically patch the violations. I saw your talk where you said, after going through this exercise, you went back to your product manager and you said, here are our choices. We can sacrifice this property, we can sacrifice this property, or we can spend months redesigning the system from scratch. That was actually um, my first talk I ever gave at a conference, tackling concurrency bugs with TLA+. That's what kind of started building me an audience of people who knew who I was. Where did formal methods come from historically? How does it fit into the history of the industry as a whole? Computer science as a discipline comes out of mathematics. Of course, there's like a lot of different influences that are really important, such as human computers in the 19th century, which were mostly women. And that's one of the reasons why women dominated programming for a long time early on. There's lots of history there. I love history, as you can probably tell. One of the things coming out of mathematics was a very strong emphasis on proof and proving things were correct. Writing programs to check the correctness of proofs was a thing that I appeared, I believe, in 1967 with this thing called Automath. And then it was by about the early 1970s where people sort of tried to flip that around and use theorem provers and like mathematical proofs to check programs. That was Euclid, which came out shortly after Pascal, the um, program language from Nicholas Wirth did. That sort of over time leads to this entire branch that plus like the ML and the um, higher order logic systems leads to like verification of code, which we see nowadays in things like Idris and Liquid Haskell, Coke, Agda. There was another branch that sort of came out of the larger scale system design of trying to verify that larger scale systems worked with, I believe, IBM's VDM, Viennese development method from roughly the same time period where they were trying to sort of find ways of building larger scale integrated systems in a way that they could be assured was correct. 
at the same time, these academics came out with this thing called Z or Z, which was sort of like the first one to go mainstream. It's actually interesting for linguistic reasons that it's written as Z, but Americans are forced to pronounce it Z because that's a part of the official specification of how it should be pronounced. And a lot of the specification languages that sort of are used to design systems branch off of Z in some way. TLA plus was originally Lamport trying to take his ideas on temporal logic, which was a different sort of branch of verifying code and combine it with Z. And then when that was rejected by the Z committee, he created TLA plus. How would you characterize the different strengths of all of these different tools, especially the ones that are still in use today? I specialize in a few different ones. The main two I specialize in that I know best and I can teach best are Alloy and TLA+. And I have a lot of criteria when one's better than the other. TLA+, is good for, say, concurrency and distributed systems. Alloy tends to be good for, like, situations where you have to derive insight about a problem where time is not involved, as in the system is not changing. One example that you can talk about is, say, authentication policies. Then there's, of course, a class of problems that neither is entirely at all suited for, like anything where you have to prove code itself is correct, in which case you start to branch into like much more difficult and much more specialist tools like dedicated theorem provers and proof assistants. How do you know which tool is the correct one? How do you know which programming language is the correct one for your problem? How do you know what's the correct food to eat today? It's one of those things that you just have to build up through experience and work and like burning yourself occasionally and reading a lot and just being well-informed. What sort of companies are interested in using TLA in production and what sort of use cases have you seen? The majority of the companies that I've seen that are interested tend to be infrastructure companies, companies that work on, say, cloud infrastructure or databases or essentially things that support other things. I think it's because people who are doing that kind of business to business stuff or like are doing internal projects tend to sort of be much more interested in the architecture of long-term systems, which tends to be more amenable towards formal verification versus direct feature work. So for example, I've worked with Cockroach Labs. I've worked with Protocol Labs. I've worked with Facebook. When I've done public classes, I've had people from like Google, Microsoft, people whose interest is sort of building internal that supports everything else. And that's also sort of what you see online when people talk about like use cases, it tends to be things like, yeah, we verified part of our lock mechanism for say the database, or we've verified our eventual consistency plans. You see that, for example, in Cosmos DB and S3. That doesn't mean that those are the only uses. I got an email a while back from somebody who found it really helpful for like modeling progression in stories for like a story-based app. And I even hear people find it useful for like games and game development, but those tend to be the people who are sort of pushing into new spaces versus the people using it in the dominant spaces. What are some examples where it's very clear that TLA plus or formal methods more generally is not the tool that they're looking for? One case, they wanted code verification. That's like a pretty obvious case. One case was there was much more low hanging fruit than using formal methods. They like needed to start from like the first principles, which were just getting tests and getting like their pipelines in order and all that. There have been a couple of cases where like what they were expecting to get out of formal methods was both one, not something they would get and two, much more suited towards other tools. That's happened a few times. There was at least one case where somebody didn't even know what it was, but they just heard it was cool. And I had to explain to them that it's not at all what they wanted. Has there been any resistance that you've encountered? A lot of people just don't think it could work. One of the things I found is that like, if you want to convince somebody what it does, you have to show them a live demo. You can't just explain it. I have like a bunch of snippets of code that is incredibly obviously correct and very simple and also has a bug. And I have to show those demos to show how it finds it and what kinds of bugs it finds. What are some of your favorite live demos? I do have a write-up on it at the business case for formal methods, which is on my website, where essentially what happens is you have a bunch of groups trading credits among each other. And what happens is you can prove that it's possible for two people to steal a credit from somebody else due to a race condition, where one person should own that credit and somebody else gets it. That's like one of the things. Then the other one is just the entire, like, we do not have time to invest in like learning. And that case, like, what can I say? That's like fundamentally cultural difference. I don't really know how to address that. Is that the main bottleneck to much more use of TLA plus and similar formal methods in industry? I think usability is the biggest barrier here. Like we can always make the tools more powerful, but they're powerful enough to do a lot. It's just getting people to start using them. What do people find inconvenient about this tool? TLA plus specifically? Yes. One, it uses a mathematical syntax versus a programmatic syntax, which I personally don't mind at all. I actually prefer it to be able to write and as a carrot instead of an ampersand, but it does sort of drive a lot of people off. And that's really something that fascinates me, how like subtle um, grammatical differences in the syntax can drive people off. It tends to be hard to use outside of using the IDE. And the IDE is great, but it doesn't suit everybody's needs and it can't suit everybody's needs. There's 
a lot of confusion that happens because like people tend to use a DSL that compiles down to raw TLA plus getting people to sort of understand those differences is always a challenge. And that's something that I need to figure out how to educate people on. Those are some of the um, examples of the potential UX challenges and each one like isn't a killer, but they become paper cuts. Most people would rather the server go down at 2am to get a root canal. Most people don't floss once a day. And if people aren't going to floss to prevent a root canal, people aren't going to use formal methods. It turns out that with almost everything in life, the argument isn't between good and bad, it's between good and easy. That's why I think UX is so critical towards adoption. How in the world did we get people to start unit testing? So I have a theory on that. And this is a theory that I don't have evidence for. Test-driven development seems to have worked because it was cultural too. It sort of attaches up to certain cultures where like, oh yeah, if you're part of this culture, you should be doing this. I think that played a barely large role. The other thing that I think mattered a lot, and this is the thing that I really want to like get more data for, is that I think RSpec played a really str- out, um, outsized role. The Ruby on Rails community in RSpec, by basically creating tools that made it really easy to do things like automatically generate fixtures and like replay like third party things to basically remove as many of those inconveniences as possible. It creates one community where like it's expected and the norm, and also like it's not nearly as painful as in other communities. Yeah, that's really fascinating combination of culture and making the tools as easy as possible. How would you push the culture more towards acceptance of formal methods? So one of the things I've been doing is making it easier to learn and trying to like make it more exciting, like writing a lot about lots of different use cases, things like verifying game layout algorithms or like databases or like migrations or like feature interaction or things, basically trying to show as many different ways of using it as possible to get more people thinking, hey, maybe this can help me. And I think that helps seed out the number of people who will try it. And once you get more people doing stuff with it, then it becomes easier to sort of get other people on board. I'm not expecting like miracles to happen, but I think it sort of creates a little bit more momentum and helps build things. Once you get more people on, then it's easier to do things like build auxiliary tooling and UX and bootstrap stuff. Do you have any vision of the future in which more people use this stuff? Absolutely. That's what I'm working towards. Here's my hope. I don't think we'll ever get a point where like the average programmer will be using this stuff. It is more of a specialist tool and like the fundamentals of learning how to model systems is challenging. I do hope that we'll reach a point where like most engineers know what it is and the benefits and the costs. How do you see this fitting into a typical company? for example, a few formal specifiers or people on the infrastructure team all using this regularly, but maybe not people on the product team. I hope that ends up being where like, it's a skill that augments what people do. So it's not that you have a specialist TLA plus writer or a specialist alloy developer. You have some people and some of them, in addition to writing code, can like sit down and write the spec for the team before they start writing the code. When we think about software correctness today, people do type checking, people have unit tests, integration tests, end-to-end tests. Some people might also do fuzzing or property-based testing. How do you see all these pieces fitting together? I am a very firm believer in defense and depth. The value of the kind of stuff I do is that it essentially lets you test and analyze designs. Does your intentions match what you actually want? You still got to learn how to program. <laughs> Nothing will save you. Types will not save you. Tests will not save you. Formal methods will not save you. You have to use a lot of things in combination. Code review, good teammates, pair programming, tests, types, contracts, sleep, adequate exercise. And you have to be well-organized. You have to have good schedules, loose deadlines. You have to be well-fed. You have to be well-rested. Nothing will save you. Everything augments everything else. Do you have any closing thoughts for our listeners? I talk about the things that need to be improved because I love it so much. And I think it is so incredibly like paradigm changing. This stuff is basically lightning in a bottle. It's fire. It is incredible. It is one of the most electrifying experiences I've ever had programming, but this isn't magic and it will not give you magic powers. Do not be a cultist. Do not be a zealot. Lightning in a bottle is a good way to get yourself zapped to death. Coding is hard because the world is hard. Things are complicated. Domains are complicated. People are complicated. Systems are complicated. These are tools that help you. They do not fix things for you. If you go into it expecting that this will solve your coding problems, you will be disappointed. Always just remember that nothing will ever be perfect. We could make it better though. All right. Where can people find you on the internet? I've got a website at hillalwayne.com. I have a newsletter that's buttoned down, hillalwayne. I'm on Twitter at hillalagram. That's not hillalwayne. And how can people find you if they want to consider formal methods for their company? Just email me, h at hillowayne.com. I'm also happy to just answer questions by email if people have them. I have an open like invitation so that people can just email me with what they want and I'll try to answer them 